Welcome to the final episode of Series 53. This is a great one. Uh, we've got some stellar discussion and some pretty great fanfic coming up. Uh, I really, really enjoyed this one. Yeah, I'm excited for people to hear this one. It's good. Mm -hmm. This whole series is very good. So good. Very good. So good. Uh, stay tuned after the episode for announcements, including an announcement about the Academon Kickstarter for this year, mm -hmm. new merch for our show, and of course, our Patreon thank yous. Absolutely. Until then, enjoy the episode, everybody. Welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time we finished our session zero for Nova. This episode, we will be discussing the character creation process. We are excited to welcome back Spencer Campbell. Do you want to reintroduce yourself for everyone and tell us about the character you made in our last episode? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. I'm Spencer Campbell. Uh, I publish under the name Gila RPGs. Uh, you can find me online at gilarpgs.com. That's also my Twitter handle. Those are the best places to find all the games that I work on. Um, I made a pox spark last time, which is a sort of a plague spark. I'm, I'm, my whole goal is to try and spread a, a small scale, small damaging plague across the battlefield and then activate it to, to uh, horrible symptoms for my enemies as we face off into the world. Um, my character, my call sign is Rasp, although that is not my call sign. My character is named Isaac. I am a, uh, a scientist that works at this giant city that we uh, we created last time. Uh, mm -hmm. And my partner is the one who does the field testing, who is the, the pox spark. Though they came back and died of some sort of infection that I'm not familiar with. Um, and it seems to have hints of lunar cult corruption going on. And to not cause a panic in the city, I have kept my partner's death secret. Uh, as I try to figure out what is going on. So I have been going out into the field in my partner's spark, uh, highly untrained, not very particularly good at, <laughs> at, at, at this thing, um, and really desperately trying to ensure that people don't realize that I'm not actually RASP, that I am uh, the, the partner. I'm, I'm just the scientist from the field who is doing my best to try and do the field work and the lab work and figure out this lunar cult conspiracy all at the same time. It's oh, fine. What could go <laughs> It'll <wrong>? be fine. <laughs> it's not like there's a lot to worry about anyway in this <laughs> this world. Or right. I mean, yeah. it's very safe. It's all very safe. <laughs> very safe. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, can you tell us about your character? Yeah, so I made a uh, call sign Crimson Lily, the Sanguine Spark, which is basically your vampire spark, uh, because why not? Uh, she, her pronouns uh, goes by Liliana in pilot, uh, uh, in civilian form, I guess you could call it. Um, so uh, uh, Liliana is uh, a, a veteran to piloting sparks. Uh, she started off as a Voyager spark, uh, doing recon and whatnot for uh, kind of an advanced team, um, but had gotten separated with the other, uh, the Sanguine spark uh, at one point, was doing some scouting, came back to her partner dead and out of the spark uh, with no traces of what exactly happened. Um, made a quick decision with enemies quick on her tail to pop into the Sanguine Spark and pilot that out of there um, and has been uh, in the Sanguine uh, ever since. Uh, so uh, she's had this uh, for probably over five years now um, and has gotten quite uh, proficient with it, I would think, at this point. Um, and uh, her her unique portion of the spark is because of her uh, iridescent uh, black and blood red cape that when it flows in the wind, it looks like flowing blood. 
Um, and that just that just is such a good aesthetic. <laughs> it's a, that's very a good aesthetic. aesthetic. I'm really proud of you. <laughs> yeah. I'm very proud. All of right, you. Amelia, tell us about yours. Well, uh, I picked the Grim Spark, uh, the Necromancer Spark. I know you're all shocked. <laughs> um, my call sign is Appetite. Uh, my pilot name is Hades. They them. Um, sort of a veteran, semi-veteran. Um, piloted a Scorch first to kind of learn how to do all of this, um, but was really good at like the tactics and sort of managing the battlefield, um, worked my way up to being a Grim. Um, and now I am hanging out in this great, terrible city where nothing is going wrong at all. Um, and hanging no, out with these thing. two that are also have nothing going on. <laughs> <laughs> everything's fine truly is ready to all implode it on itself at a moment's I, notice there's so many little strings to pull on here like i i feel like we have given a gm a lot to mm. work with here <laughs> oh yeah uh political intrigue uh all the way up to eldritch horror yeah and he, something for everyone in between. Exactly. Oh yeah. <laughs> we don't have any. We don't have any romance, but yeah, there's still oh. time. There's oh. still time. <laughs> there's there's always there's time, time for romance. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. All right. Well, let's go ahead and dive right into a segment that we are calling D twenty for your thoughts. D twenty for your thoughts. In this segment, we like to talk to our guests about their thoughts on character creation and how it relates to this game and other games. But first, the most cliche question of all RPG podcasts ever. How did you get here? How did you start playing RPGs? How did you start designing them? So I got, uh, I'm, I'm a relatively late bloomer in terms of role-playing games. I didn't get into role-playing games until grad school. Um, so I had played you know, board games and all of that all, all up until that point, but ne had never dived into RPGs. And with um, with my brother and some of his uh, close friends in Chicago, I took a stab at running a running a dungeon world campaign. Um, and my brother mm -hmm. is uh an improv an improviser a comedian in Chicago. And if you're unfamiliar with Chicago, Second City produces uh, mm -hmm. some of the best comedic actors uh, ever. And so I was sitting at a table with mm -hmm. a bunch of improv comedians uh, as a first time GM. Running a game for the first time. You are brave. Oh, no. and, uh, <laughs> it was unbelievably fun uh, to to play with them. And, and I say this a lot. I think they're that playing those early campaigns, those early sessions with them had a huge impact on me as a designer because it I was free of those concepts of I mean Dungeon World on its own is not an inherently prep heavy game anyway but like I tried I tried to do like a bunch of prep and then they mm -hmm. and then they, then they did what they then, did yeah. and I <laughs> <laughs> what improvisers right. do yeah. and it it was sort of this light bulb moment for me where I realized that the place that I like to play is in that space of the table decides almost everything that very little is decided ahead of time and that we we can be malleable uh, at the table and create the thing that we want together rather than a one person preps it the other everybody else kind of plays in the playground uh, sort of thing and so my the, so that was a, a huge impact on me as a as a designer it's very strange like a lot of my early games that i played were pbta games or like weird hacks of pbta games that were not like officially published <laughs> versions of yeah. things and so i did not start with the dragon game i did not start with the things that i mm -hmm. think typically we see and so uh i think that was that that has definitely <laughs> had an impact on making me <laughs> who i am right um in fact mm -hmm. my earliest design was trying to make a star wars equivalent of uh, like a, a pbta game because we are all huge Star Wars nerds in that group. And so I wanted oh, to yeah. to make that. And that was really fun. And so, uh, yeah, my so the, my early days of even just playing games came from that space. And then design came uh, my earliest designs and still my designs today are um, inspired by I think I like to say that I'm heavily inspired by board games and a lot of stuff that I do uh, in my mm -hmm. role playing games. Um, so like Sp uh, Spire. Sp I wish I could say I made Spire. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can. I mean, what's yeah, Grant well, going to do? 
<laughs> Fight me. Fight me. <laughs> um, Slayers uh, is heavily inspired by my love of asymmetry that we see in board games, like in games like Root. Uh, so I, I had always loved the game Root, and I said, can we do this with role-playing games? And so um, my early design games came from a space of make a lot of it up together, um, play with weird spaces with what people can do, um, and... Uh, my other big philosophy is to throw the concept of balance wildly out the window and then stomp on yeah. it to make sure that it's dead. Uh, and so that's that's how I I came from a place of playing board games. I came from a place of playing power fantasy video games, and I play came from a place of playing with improv comedians, and all of that came together to to make me the designer that I am. And I've I've been designing for the last two and a half years. That's yeah, I think amazing. you can see all of those pieces in this game for sure. Um, mm -hmm. And I noticed um, when you talk about balance too, like that used to be one of the questions mm. that we we had in our outline was like, okay, how balanced uh. is this game? And then we had so many designers on that were like, balance, who cares about balance? <laughs> and so like we, we took that out because we had so many people that were like, balance is stupid. It um, you know, for me, and it's it's a very old school concept at this point. It really is. And like on top of that, like for, for me, I'm anti-balance for a few reasons. One is the fun factor on its own. Like it's, it's, I just, I'd rather just do the thing that is fun and feels wildly overpowered than the thing that is balanced mm -hmm. and not. Mathematical balance is also difficult to accomplish. So if anything, you try mm -hmm. to accomplish um, like perceptive, like what, what people perceive as balance as opposed to mathematical balance. Um, mm -hmm. But then on top of that, my biggest thing is no fight would ever be fair. No fight would ever right. be fair in any situation. You would always fight dirty and try <laughs> and be, fight, be mm -hmm. in a fight where you would have the advantage. So the, the concept of right. trying to balance an encounter seems foreign to the concept of fighting. <laughs> to me. Right, mm -hmm. right. Nobody would get in a fight if you weren't like pretty <laughs> you sure you, you were going to win. win. <laughs> yeah. I mean, unless you're an idiot. Right. So, well, especially you know. when your life is on the line, right? Right. right. Exactly. Which, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Which in most RPGs, those are the kinds of stories right. you're playing. It's, it's right? pretty yeah. life or death yeah. most of the time. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, what do you look for in a system as far as character creation goes? Like, what sort of pieces need to be there uh, for you th for you to be able to create uh, really great characters? For me, it's uh, the the number one most important thing is speed. Um, this is something that I've just learned in general is a preference of mine. You know, when I when I did my early like fantasy campaigns, I would do the like once a week four hour sessions that it like had like sort of like I had absorbed from the ether is like what you're supposed to do with a fantasy game. Yeah. And so it would be these long things. And so I, I was I had been drilled into this idea of like it has to be these long epic things all the time and so you need character creation that will follow that that'll support that sort of thing and for me an ideal session is now like 90 minutes after 90 minutes i'd be like are we done have we accomplished what we wanted to accomplish cool we'll we'll meet it in a week <laughs> i know i was gonna say i play about two hour sessions and i'm like my attention span i don't know if it's gotten worse as i've gotten older or what but i'm like how did i sit mm -hmm. for four hours like why did i think that that was a good amount of time right so for me i like to think about a character creation process that moves quick too and it doesn't have to be like it's done in five minutes but i what i mean is that there are not a lot of paths that you have to explore before you make decisions but instead like mm -hmm. you're you you feel like you're making progress in the character creation process at a at a clip that feels like you're like is accomplishing things you're not sitting there going okay i need to study this for 30 minutes before i decide this next important decision that i'm making as opposed to like okay it might take me like five seven minutes to make this like really key decision but then we're on to the next thing so right. speed's really important to me but also i've learned now more so um the character creation is fine but characters are created through play and they're created through mm -hmm. sessions even if it is a one shot you i not and say yes as if we like <laughs> <laughs> like yes they are created through play i say as we never play right. the characters yeah, exactly, right. <laughs> but like you know we we have our we have the bones of our characters here and we've, we've got some really cool bones but i'm excited to see them evolve and so to me character creation is equally important to world creation and yes. world creation is always more interesting to me when there is uh, collaboration at the table. So, you know, we did this thing mm. where we made our very cool, actually not cool, it sounds like a nightmare city <laughs> that we made. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that was fascinating because cool. now um, 
even if I was the GM, I wouldn't have thought about all of that stuff on my own. And now I now I know that there are these hooks that the players are interested in exploring. And so uh, mm-hmm. character creation is um, Im- equally as important to me as like world uh, world creation or like, you know, a lot of things that you see in session zero where you're establishing like, what are the things that we want to see? It's why I think beats are like the greatest thing that were ever created for role-playing games ever. I think mm-hmm. beats that we see mm-hmm. in art are just like, it's... <laughs> Again, I'm gonna fight Grant because I'm how <laughs> good he is. At this <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Uh, like I, I'm a huge advocate for beats because it kind of keeps that character creation process ever going. We're like, this is the next thing that I want my character to to be and to explore uh, mm-hmm. in narrative ways. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that he and Chris referred to those as scenes we want to mm-hmm. see, um, like from whose line. And mm-hmm. it's it's true. It is like I love being able to as a player sit down and say, like, here's what I want you to do. And I think I have that in our um, in our session zero document, too, of like, what are the themes and stories and like story beats that you as a player want to hit? Like, what do you want your GM to bring up for you? Right. And it's mm-hmm. such a good um it's such a good conversation to have that I think, you know, for so long it was like, okay, well, I'll sit here and I'll hope that the GM does what I want them to do. And it's like, no, just tell them what you want. Just just say the words and they'll do it. And, and that can, that can yeah. go so sideways when you make those sort of assumptions because, like, you either, like, do the thing where you write five pages of backstory and then uh, <laughs> yes. it either becomes completely irrelevant because it's ignored or it becomes the only thing that you do and then it becomes very prescriptive and also stops the spotlight necessarily from shining on other players and so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to me just having like two or three things that you are very fascinated by as a character but also a player and then we then find the next thing that you're interested in through play as opposed to here's the long ev- elaborate thing that i must resolve and it's here's why mm-hmm. um yeah. right right and it's like go take that home and write your novel right. <laughs> right. the rest of us will play right. the game yeah exactly Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I, I like that we are not creating characters on this podcast. We're creating potential. Mm. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting. Uh, so we might have to rebrand as like a potential person podcast or something. Oh, yeah, that's a uh, good one. That's th- a good one. Potential, yeah, potential people podcast. Potential people <laughs> podcast is pretty fun. <laughs> it is. It is. That's another another bonus episode that we can make, Ryan. There you, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that we like to do is we like to look at character sheets um, and talk about the intention of the design behind character sheets, because I think they can tell us a lot about um, what you're going to use and what you're going to do in a game. Can you tell us a little bit about um, some of the decisions that you made as far as the design of your character sheets? Yeah, so um, the the decision process or the design process by, for the character sheets is actually largely driven by Jam, who did the uh, the layout from this. She is an incredible uh, layout artist and designer. So Jam and Eddie are the reason that Nova looks as good <laughs> as it does. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I, I had described to Jam this idea that these are... It's it's builds, and this is something that we talked about in our our time uh, in the, the previous episodes. Of I consider these end game characters. So you are level twenty, so now it's about builds. What are the things that are going to make your character play differently, or the way that you want them to play? So the sheet needed to represent this idea of being able to sort of like slot in almost mods into places, so that you knew what was powering your spark at a given time. And so uh, I think Jam did a really good job of sort of creating these sort of like containers and pools where uh, mods will live but then also places where it's clear like this is plugged into this and this is the thing that you are currently using um i also think that the character sheet just um looks kind of like a, a hud of sorts like a, like it really does like this, it really does like something you'd see in like you know yeah fallout or borderlands or something like mm-hmm. that I, you know i can even imagine like a mini version of this is in our sparks uh you know like in the hud of like inside mm-hmm. we see like a, a quick you know rundown of our equipped mod so that we know what's going on and we see the meters of health and fuel and so mm-hmm. um i think jam really knocked it out of the park in terms of uh highlighting that this is about custom customization rather than a um like a full definition of who your character is if that makes sense yeah Mm. i know one of the things i always comment on um is is how easy it is to figure out where things go 
on a character sheet because nothing annoys me more than picking out mm. things and then being like, I don't know where to put this now. Like you told me it was an important decision, but my sheet does not imply that at mm. all. Mm -hmm. um, and this one was, you know, again, when I, I didn't have to like ask any questions, it was like, okay, it's obvious that this slots in over here and that this spot is for this. And, um, it was really easy to just look at it and say, okay, I can see that these things are important. This is what I need to know. And it was only one page. I love that. Right. Which was, nice, <laughs> which was really nice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I do like how, uh, it, it feels like this would be almost like an interface for uh, like a video game mm. too uh, at the same time where like I would I would click and drag what I've got in here to the various slots and, and attach it to the the cool power or whatever and it'll have that that satisfying sound yeah. effect that happens with yes that. it does feel like that you're right it does feel like it would make like some kind of like clicking or like something would, when you put it yeah in. when you drag it in you yeah. see like the tool tip for the power like update when you drag it in you see like the green arrow the numbers are going up or yes, something you it, see, like, yeah. it looks like that. that that's that's yeah <laughs> and and i can picture this on the screen where you have your uh your spark mm. And then, like the the way it augments, like oh. it has a visual change. <laughs> yes, for... yeah. So it like spins as you do it, and like as you put the like slot the mod in, something like lights up on the actual like yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I have to make a Nova video. It game. looks <laughs> like the sheet does that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, honestly, a Nova video game with a Dynasty Warriors sort of uh, combat aesthetic with all these powers. Oh mm -hmm. my god. And goodness. then maybe like a city building thing too. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, great. Okay. No. okay. I'll right. devote my life to this now. <laughs> great. Great. Now go ahead and quit yeah, your day right. job and then. Yeah. <laughs> no, it needs to happen. No. <laughs> so, how do we think then character creation in Nova stacks up to other systems that we've played? I personally would say um, it's quick, it was really quick. I always quick. expect our recordings to take a while. And I was like looking at the clock as I'm like, oh, we are like, really? Yeah, it wasn't like, too bad. We're like, powering like through. Before like we got to we the extra that. stuff with the city building and and like fleshing out the, the actual pilot stuff, yeah. um, like it was, it was pretty fast. It was. Yeah. It was. I liked that it um, once we we picked that initial like type. That it was like, okay, now I don't have nearly, I don't feel nearly as overwhelmed by the decisions. Mm. It was like, okay, you were initially like, there's the nine choices. And then from there, my personal choices that I have to make are very small. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like that really in total, there's lots of options that you can, you can pick, but I don't have to pay attention to what Ryan's choices are. I just have to pay attention to my choices, yeah. which feels a lot less overwhelming than something that's like, okay, now pick four skills. And here's a list of 800 skills. And, uh -huh. you know, um, well, yeah, like I, if I you had to if you had to pick from like, here's all the uh, persistent mods possible in existence, uh, figure out which uh, ones would apply to the your specific mech. And and then they would all have to be generic. Like, right. You, you wouldn't get that extra delicious flavor. No, uh, like you do. No. Uh, and it was like, yeah, it's like four that are like. You know, the persistent mods, it's like four that are stats, four that are kind of flavorful, um, you know, and then just like pick from those. And because um, I, I hate comparing everything to PBTA because I just feel like we talk about PBTA <laughs> as like the only like sort of like, you know, toolkit kind of thing. Um, but I like that it had that same like I pick my thing and then my choices are in front of me. However, uh -huh. unlike PBTA, because they are mods, I really like that you can slot them in and out. I like that under unlike playbook moves where I pick them and then that's mine and that's it. And I have to find situations to make that thing fit. This was like in between. If you want to pop it out and put it, put something else in that spot because you think that'll apply better. Go for it. Uh -huh. I loved that. I love it so much. <laughs> so I'm so glad to hear the, that you that sentiment of um, not having to think about what other people are doing during this process, because, you know, that can be a big part of character creation is thinking about like party dynamics and like, do we have all the roles mm -hmm. of sure. a party covered? And for sure. Like, is there a healer? Is there like, oh, nope, we're all going to die. Right. Okay. <laughs> is there a tank? And, and yeah. we don't have to worry about that because. Again, this is a power fantasy where we're all incredibly powerful on our own. Like, we'll be fine. And then we only just become cooler and more powerful 
like doesn't matter who our teammates are. We're we're going to be good. Right. We're going to be fine. And we found like only after the fact, like, oh, OK, so we've all done this. Now let's think about how our party would like how would we function in the mm-hmm. battlefield? And then we realized like how it would work. And that was cool. Instead of having to think like, OK, we don't have a healer. Somebody has to be the healer. And then like somebody just gets right. assigned that role. Right. Yeah, yeah I did like that because I know as we were as we're looking through the different sparks and the options too, like always in the back of my mind is that like, okay, like who's going to play, you know, mm. the tank, who's going to play the healer, who's going to, you know, cause usually Ryan is our healer and uh-huh. I am not. And <laughs> <laughs> um, which is funny. Cause when I play overwatch, I always play a healer. Um, but I liked not having to think about that because even when you're reading the abilities, um, it's pretty clear that, everybody can kind of do a little bit of like you can do enough to keep you alive um which is always being (laughs) self-sufficient to a certain degree is always kind of nice because then it doesn't become somebody's whole job to like not participate in the adventure like Mm -hmm. the adventure's happening here and somebody else has to be facing back here to make sure that everybody else can participate that's always like kind of a Mm -hmm. bummer to me yeah, well, plus the fact that you're going into it knowing that you can't die. Yeah. <laughs> right. That you're going to win. That, That's true. That, That's true. That, that is a big like, part of the game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it takes a lot of that, like, pressure of, is our party balanced for Am I making all the game? right choices? To, yeah. There's a lot yeah. less pressure there of, like, am I making a character that can, like, really hold their own here? And it was like, everybody can. It's fine. Yeah. What looks cool? What feels mm-hmm. cool? Yeah. I like that. The rule of cool uh, yeah. baked into character creation. Yeah, mm-hmm. I need to get the rule the of cool generally. tattooed on me because it truly fuels literally everything I do, both in, <laughs> in design yeah. and running and playing games. Like that's that's number yeah. one. I mean, I feel like we. I know we kind of answered that question for you. Do you have Do you have thoughts about how this stacks up? Other than like you mentioned, you like it to be quick. Um, which this definitely was. I, I think just the the thing that is important to me is, and it's the one that I, I had highlighted before, is just that there are no necessarily like traditional roles covered by the Sparks. Like you can find like, like the Warden is pretty tanky and like the Scorch is yeah. kind of caster like, but they don't have to be that way. Like a Warden with the right mm-hmm. mods is terrifying. Like they can pick people up basically turn them into grenades and throw them at other people. And so... Oh my God, that's so like, cool. You don't have, <laughs> that's so You don't cool. have to be the person that everybody stands behind. You could be the person that's running around literally like throwing enemies at each other and exploding them. So, so my, good. you know, my, my hope is that this has created a scenario where you don't feel like you've ever chosen the wrong spark. You you've never feel like you feel like you have to choose a particular thing because the game... Uh, requires it or the party dynamics require it and that it you can do mm-hmm. what you want and certainly that exists in some games but other games there's definitely that necessity of like we need the we need the fighter role we need the caster role and, and etc so yeah mm-hmm. yeah i felt like that freed me up a lot to do kind of whatever i wanted mm-hmm. um i mean and granted like on this show i always have that freedom <laughs> because we don't have to play the game but we do still end up kind of doing that mm. a lot of the time, um, being like, OK, well, we could, you know, we don't have this, so I'll do that. Um, and not yeah. having to do that is kind of nice. Absolutely. How does the process of character creation in this game reinforce what playing the game is going to feel like? How does it set those expectations for us? I know I had a real visceral reaction, like at one point that was like, where everything mm. clicked. Yeah. Like we, we we were talking about, you know, combat's a puzzle. Here's you're going to have different puzzle pieces, different actions to choose. And then you've got these mods to to add some cool effects and stuff. And I think the point where I found out that plus one range <laughs> made that big of a difference. <laughs> added to an AoE uh that affects everything around you. Mhm. Like I was like, oh, I get it. It's like we talked about things like literally like making that click sound. Like, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Right? Ryan's brain's doing that too. (laughs) It was like, wait a minute. Oh, 
Oh yes, this is. This, you got I, so I excited. You were now. like plus one, right? Like I don't think I've ever seen anybody get that excited about a plus one in my life. <laughs> it made me so happy when you had that light bulb moment. I was like, yes, yes, you yeah, see now it. You get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was I was excited uh, uh, about the game and excited about like the the potential that, of everything we had been talking about up to that point. But then once I got that realization. I was like, now I need this like f- sort of combat role play because it is just oh, it's so mm-hmm. like like just from character creation, I've got this like it's going to be like this strategic uh, sort of, you know, I'm almost a rock, paper, scissors sort of thing, but like to the next mm. level yeah, sort of deal. And. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I really think it highlighted that sort of puzzle kind of aspect that you were talking about, about like even just like picking the the mods that go with which th- and which thing I was going to slot it into and that kind of stuff too. very much. Um, it fit that description that you gave us for combat of things, you know, like not being mm-hmm. like, are you going to win? But how? Um, and, and it really looks like, okay, well, I can do all of these things, but how am I going to do them? How well am I going to do them? Like, yeah. which ones am I going to use more? Uh, and I feel like that really reinforced that concept that you were talking about before. And, and scene, uh, we've got 12 slots on the character sheet for persistent mods that you own, 12 slots for power mods that you own, and then you can have four persistent mods like at once and two uh power mods for each power like i ryan's brain is just like 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 having those all filled up (laughs) (laughs) just like i can see like all of the little like sparks like connecting as all of the little Uh pathways it's like okay yeah my my brain probably looks looks like what the moon looks like in this world with I mean, that's this is so exactly what I was hoping to kind of convey in the character creation and just in the the idea of you are max level characters. It's about builds now. It's about, you, you know, even if you took no mods into the field, you would be incredibly effective on missions. And now it's mm-hmm. you are the max level. How, what equipment do you want to uh, to slap on that is going to make those missions feel the way that you want them to feel? Uh and how mm. cool can I look while I do yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the combos. That's the, like one of my favorite things is people figuring out the really wild combos that you can pull off, both just like mm-hmm. internally, like what your own character can do. But then you start to exactly like think about like, so if I do this and you do this, can you imagine what yeah. we can do? Like Ryan came mm. to the realization that he can just take his own blood out of his body, give it to one of us to heal us effectively and kill himself which activates the supernova which (laughs) it just like (laughs) right which then creates all kinds of dead things that i can then play around exactly yeah yeah it's very cool it's very cool in the comics there's that concept of like the fastball special where like colossus throws wolverine at somebody like i want i wanted the fastball special to be a thing that just kind of happens naturally in nova where you're like oh my god i can't believe that if you do this it sets me up to do this and it just kind of goes from there. And I can just imagine yeah. how cool that feels in play, you know, because I've, I've talked a couple times now about how like combat for me really tends to mm. drag because it gets kind of like it, it is the only part of role playing games where there are really defined distinct turns to where it's like not everybody gets to do something right now. Like this part is not collaborative. Mm. Um, whereas it feels like in this one, it, it really is because we need to be able to set each other up to do those things to have like the maximum mm-hmm. impact. And it really is that kind of puzzle um, that just oh, you, my, my brain start, really likes that. My brain really yeah. likes that. And and like in in game, in the story, you can start naming these maneuvers. Mm. Oh, my mm. gosh, you could. <gasps> right? You could name the combos. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, let's do and, that. And just kidding. Oh, yeah. it, but. You know, the rules of Lumen and, yes, and so Nova basically dictate that all the players go first and they get to decide in whatever order they want to go. So you discover these combos as you play and you realize like, OK, we need, you know, we need uh, Sanguine to go first and then, you know, Pox and then Grim follows up. And then we realize the different ways that we can change that order because we all do stuff. And then the GM 
acts and reacts to us. And then we have now a new situation on the battlefield for us to, to ponder. We go, OK, do we need a new combo that's going to overcome this next thing? Like, how do we overcome, you know, this weird twist that's been uh, brought on? And so it just kind of cycles into that oh, again yeah. and again. Oh, it's so good. It's I so good. Lo- I love this narrative uh, challenge type of fun that yeah. you've unlocked with this, that like normally challenge fun is like, all right, what well, what do I need to do to to get this thing's hit points mm-hmm. down to zero? Mm-hmm. And where can I position? And all this that is sort like stuff. dungeon puzzles, but combat. Yeah. 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 yeah that's that. That was yeah. my goal. I love I love yeah, I love to hear it. that. Oh, that makes me so happy. Yeah. <laughs> I love that about this show too when we're like, okay, so here's what I think and then designers oh. like that's what I wanted and we're like, "Oh." Ah, it's really <laughs> you did it really is the best feeling when you're like cuz you do, you know, you do play testing and stuff, but a lot of this still is done on your own. It's like and in your head. It's, yeah. it's what I believe the game is supposed to do, but does it do that or does do does do other people sense that and get that vibe and then the second they say it it's the it's the greatest feeling in the world yes. it's so good when you're like oh, <laughs> it did do the thing yeah. i wanted it to do i know I, I love people's faces when we say that and they're like yes good I, good i am thoroughly tempted to make a lumen magical girls game there you go oh, i would like to see you try it i don't have time <laughs> okay well when you finish your 800 other playbooks for I your know. Game you're doing. <laughs> um, well, one of the questions that I always love uh, asking designers, uh, what do you think is one of the biggest flaws of character creation in mm. Nova? And what is one of your favorite parts? Um, they're hmm, interesting, interesting. I, I almost feel like they're two sides of the same coin. I, I So here's my my thing for biggest flaw is, you know, we mentioned the idea that um, we aren't overwhelmed with a giant list of mods and stuff like that. But I think there is still a, a, a tax on cognitive load in Nova character creation because there there are enough mods that when you realize that you can move them around, you're now playing around mm-hmm. with the combinations that emerge. And, you know, yeah. it's only mm-hmm. two mods, but even still two mods swapping around the different mods and moving them into different powers and things like there's a lot that you can puzzle out and oftentimes what happens is people puzzle something out and then they play a session and they realized they could have done something differently or like the it didn't it, the the there's a different combo that would have worked more in line with their doing and i always encourage people to just then like okay do it again like just you know swap out your mods that's fine i'm not your dad i won't stop you um right. but um <laughs> I do think that there it can be um, it can be a lot. And if you are the sort of person who wants to like min max, like I think it can be that sort of thing where you could sit like you'd want to like not do it in person at the table, but you'd want to like give me my homework to study <laughs> the all the possible combos. And mm-hmm. that can be fun for people. But can I think it can definitely be um it can be overwhelming for sure. So I think that yeah, that I can, can see be that. tricky. Um, and so uh, you know, my my greatest recommendation is to just be flexible with one another. Like you know, you you technically established your attributes and health and fuel before this, and then you might realize afterwards as you're doing mods, like oh, actually, I, I kind of wish my health was a little lower or that I had a little more sun, and you mm-hmm. know, you it's, you're technically done with that step, and you shouldn't go backwards, but why not right and so, right exactly <laughs> games are supposed to be right. fun <laughs> um so i i know not everyone agrees but i think that that <laughs> is probably the the trickiest part of it um the best part i'll go in a different direction i think the best part is that uh you can literally i guess it's kind of similar you can do no wrong though <laughs> is that like right. there's no you can't make there's nothing that just doesn't right. you work. You can't make a bad character. And I think that's really Im- important is that you can't make a character mm-hmm. that is going to be ineffective, uh, won't do anything out there, will fail. Mm-hmm. Because, again, the powers just happen by you spending fuel to do them. So you always get to do these things. And uh, even if you had no mods, you'd still be super powerful. So, um, mm-hmm. yes, it, it could be a lot but uh, to choose, but at the end of the day kind of just like choose and you you'll you'll, you totally will be like technically you will be yeah Um, 
mm-hmm. we talked about that um in our um in our legend of the five mm. rings episodes that like that was one of the comments we had about the game is that it's too easy to make a bad yeah. character that you can mm-hmm. walk out of character creation having made decisions that meant you could not do core things that your character was supposed to be able to do and that absolutely is not the case in this one is that like mm-hmm. you can do things that are maybe more optimal um depending on the situation but overall you never won't be able to do what you're supposed to do Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and also a big part of that comes from that there are no skill lists in most Lumen games, too. So, like, your combat effectiveness is great because your powers always work, but also out of combat. Like, you have attributes that allow you to... You're these incredibly highly technologically advanced robots. You're going to be able to do most things. So, like, just roll your attribute, and with the uh, the way the odds work, you're probably going to succeed. So, you know, uh, or there might be a complication. So... Truly, my goal was to make it so that nobody ever felt like they had wasted the character creation process and that they need to, like, start Mm -hmm. new Mm -hmm. and or anything like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ryan, it's time. Yes. It's time for fanfic. (laughs) 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 This is the part where we pretend that we played the game. Uh Um. Okay, I want to know, like, what kind of like what kind of missions are we going on? What are we what are we doing? What does the government have us doing? That's my first question is like, what kind of stuff do they want us to do? Because that, yeah, because that's the question of like, what are our missions? I think it depends on like where we are in the timeline of our campaign. Mm Because we we talked about like early on, exactly like you said, like the government or like whoever runs this city, like largely uses us as a force to do things that probably just keep the city functioning and running and stuff like that. Um, I imagine we do. I, I imagine like, Yeah, we have a giant sun shard, but I think we also still have to, like, get a lot of stuff for the city or Mm. just like um, the sun shard powers things. uh, But we probably need like raw material to keep expanding the way we are. And so, like, finding and securing locations that hold stuff is probably like some of our earliest, most important work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think possibly finding more of those like smaller towns mm, um, yep. so that we can kind of like expand like between them, um, you know, expand out from theirs and then into ours, kind of absorb them. I, um, I can imagine uh, a big thing in this world would be moving some of the smaller sun shards as well. Ooh, yeah. like, can you pick like, them up and move them? Like I, I can imagine. You're that like I don't know. If we've got, it's if your we've got name, this man. advanced tech, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, right, because like, okay, so you've got these, uh, these smaller shards that could conceivably be, you know, relocated. Even if you have to dig up a big mound of dirt underneath that that is lodged into to mm-hmm. move that mound. Mm-hmm. Like, if it's in the middle of nowhere, that's not going to help anything. You want to get it either near a river so you can have some fresh water or near uh, like a mine for like the resources uh, near a place with fertile ground for uh, for doing some farming or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So like I can see some of the missions being like we need to set up like an auxiliary satellite settlement uh, near this this mine or something for some, you know, metal and whatnot. So we're moving a sun shard today. Uh, You're on guard duty. Um, and you know, I, I think like most of the missions that we go on as a trio probably involve some sort of biohazard potential. It feels well. very on brand for our three spots. Yeah, bars. yeah <laughs> right? I can totally see that. Um, but also, I want to just fight hordes of bad guys. I kind of do too. Like yeah. at some point, I want to fight spooky creatures. Yes, yeah, sure. just just like just like weird waves, stuff. waves of weird, spooky creatures that we can enthrall and just like. And this is not a blood. thing that I have ever said before, is that like I would like to just fight like a bunch of dudes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I think. I think that's cool then with like this idea of we're trying to either like set up satellite places or we're trying to like find sun shards. Like there will be other people out there finding sun shards that are either like I imagine like creatures of the dusk are drawn to it just because the, it, they somehow like absorb the power and they become more <laughs> grotesque than they already mm-hmm. are. I imagine like lunar cults are out there trying to destroy the shards before they mm-hmm. get secured. And so we have to go like stop 
cultist uh, uprisings. Mm-hmm. Oh, big fan of that. The Corvus definitely want the shards because they're stuck on this planet. And I'm sure they want to just get off. And they're like, if this is the only power source, we're going to take it. And we have advanced technology to do it. So I feel like... Right. Uh, I think with like the level of tech our city is at, like I feel like the Corvus are like our biggest threat because they are the only like one of the probably the only other like tech levels out there that match our mm-hmm. giant grotesque city that we, we work yeah, out of. Horrible place or horrible <laughs> yeah. dystopia. Yeah. So we're we're gonna go kill a lot of alien birds. I'm okay yeah. with that. <laughs> yeah. But I also I, like the idea that like maybe they're not so bad compared to our terrible you know mm-hmm. political yeah. situation that we've created I, I do like humans are the real monsters i'm a big uh, fan of that trope that is always, a good trope it always hits it always does a good uh-huh. it's always good it's a little too real <laughs> yeah i i i want to okay so i i feel like at some point there's an inflection point in our our journey mm. uh through these missions like we're just doing the standard stuff and whatever whatever but then like um, we're sent to like, like maybe there's like a mountain that has a shard embedded in it, mm-hmm. like deep in the mountain. And there was a civilization there. Like there was a city that built up around that. But now that city's like a ghost city. Mm-hmm. Like there's nobody that lives there anymore. The shard is still there. It's still like powering things, but there's like no control over it anymore. What happened and to them? And we find out that it was purposefully done. Like so our, our city, shard. our city did oh. it to steal that oh. shard. We're the worst. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm with the bird people on this one. Yep. Yeah. So yep. like we're going there to move I that shard. I also want to get off this planet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, oh, this is good. And like. I know so my character is kind of conflicted because I've got this weird like lunar virus on my dead partner. I almost feel like I'll reach a point where I'll be like, maybe we should just unleash this <laughs> on like the oh. inner circle. Like if we if we can like quarantine oh, off the middle. There's a big dinner party and, and we release the oh, lunar no. cult plague through <laughs> and we try to keep it contained and then we of try. course it doesn't. Yeah, well and, and then of course, becomes, yeah, they don't wear masks and then yeah. Right. And then the lunar cult has their in on our city, and so now we're also dealing with that. Yeah, except for the wealthy ones that are able to get to their sparks fast enough. Right. And they they're and, up in Babylon, that garden. That un- beautiful in the garden spire city. Above. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> I'm both like excited and shaking my fist at these people. <laughs> I can't believe we could. these people are horrible. We made them. This is our yeah. own doing. <laughs> oh, I, I really, yourselves. I really want the aesthetic of like near the end of the campaign of that tower falling. Oh, <sighs> yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. absolutely it falls yeah i oh. think it falls but then i think also like the greenery part kind of like takes over some of it too yeah just eats it alive interesting oh yeah, that yeah, yeah oh now the city's like getting sectioned off into like uh, the various threats right because now you've got yeah. like haze dwellers those beasts like are like loose and like using their connection to like nature to rapidly evolve and take over the center central ring Mm -hmm. And we've got cults everywhere. We've got the birds that are like on the humans are on their side in the outer ring and causing a revolution. Yeah. Let's not forget the bandits that are out there. The Mm. there's the hellions (laughs) who just want to light everything on fire. So who knows what they're doing? Lest we not forget the giant tentacled monstrosity (laughs) in the ocean. That's right. We did put Cthulhu over in the ocean (laughs) too. Just in case. I guess we'll have to get to that. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Hordes of like squishy monsters to kill. Yeah. And a uh, giant battle. Mm-hmm. Like one one giant one monstrosity. Giant thing. So like a bunch yeah, of one... smaller squishy things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like like you've got to face this like 500 foot tall behemoth that's coming from the ocean. Does it control the weather or did it just like get struck by lightning? I think it just got more powerful by the lightning. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> like it's, it's feeding. It's feeding from the lightning. It's energy. lightning. OK. Yeah, yeah. so it it feeds off of energy. So, of course, what's the closest giant energy source within range? Mm. Uh, Oh, is it our city? Giant spire spotlight in the middle of, uh, you know, near the coastline. Dark, dark planet. Yep. Oh, Mm -hmm. I want to fight a giant. 
I want to fight a giant squid. I want to play the four year long campaign that <laughs> covers all just this entire our... arc. Yeah. <laughs> right, not to mention all of the other stuff that would come up along the way. Right, right? exactly. Yep. Uh-huh. Well, but we're not going to. So instead. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, we will move into our advancement segment and take it up a level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. In this segment, we like to cover how character advancement and character growth work. I know you touched on it a little bit um, in the beginning, but let's talk about like leveling up. How does quote unquote leveling up work in Nova? Um, and then mechanically, what happens when you do? So um, leveling up happens just at the end of missions. When you complete a mission in Nova, your spark advances, and that comes in the form of gaining access to new mods. So you only select two mods in the beginning of the game with character creation, but as the character sheet implies, you have the ability to kind of pool and collect lots more of these. So as you complete more missions, Um, You don't have things like HP increases or new skills that you get. Instead, you're choosing new mods to add to your pool. Mm -hmm. And then between missions, you're deciding with your collection of mods, which are the ones that I want to do. So again, kind of trying to capture that idea of you really don't level up anymore because you're at max level. It's now I've got all this different equipment on. Which equipment do I want to wear on this mission so that I behave the way that I do, that that I fight the way that I want to fight on this particular Mm -hmm. mission? Cool. Oh, it's so good. I can I can imagine like uh, narratively too, like th- like you're getting access for different reasons. Like, oh, hey, you did a good job. Here's a here's a new mod for you because we think mm-hmm. it'll help you out. To like, I need this mod. Mm. They're not letting me have it. It's time to do a heist. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. I also was thinking like we need like a Q NPC too. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Someone who's kind of like giving you like readouts on all of your stuff and saying like yeah. this is, you know yeah. I, analyzed, I analyzed the data of your last mission and i noticed that you <laughs> need right to be i slightly... invented this new thing for right you. Yeah. yeah yeah i Absolutely. do like that i do like that character a lot mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah i like the idea that that um but I, I really like the idea of a heist ryan i really like the yeah. idea of like that is you know like the mechanical reward being a story piece of like we had to go get it and now mm. now i have this thing because i stole it yeah yeah I mean, i'm such a sucker for crime in game so i was yeah, gonna say I you think, said that uh, at the beginning <laughs> that like you like when your games have crime. well we solved that for you yeah we? wow nova crime <laughs> is here and we're ready to right. do it uh-huh. I'm stealing in. mods <laughs> yep absolutely my goodness yep, probably from some of the rich people they probably have mods oh, that we don't have absolutely oh, yeah. have it. right because like we're government funded so you know for sure we don't have all the nice things that the rich people have that can even make the heist really dangerous too, because like we had talked about the the wealthy having these like customized uh, sparks of their own, but if these sparks have access to tech that we don't, like yeah. that makes it like oh we'll just go take it from the rich people, and then we realize that they have like this wickedly advanced tech that we <laughs> have right. never faced before, and we're like oh yeah, this yeah, is like new. private military level, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that would be so uh, and- much fun. That's what, very okay. Tack, that's now it's a five year campaign. It's like yeah. we we I know we joked about it earlier, but we have so so many hooks in the city itself that we would never we need would to never leave. have to go outside <laughs> of it. Yeah. Just do it all in the city. Yep. <laughs> oh, but how how dangerous would some of these supernovas be in the middle of a populated center? Right. Exactly. Right. That's true too. Oh. Yeah, oh. just, that's the last thing you need is sparks Yikes. that are literally exploding in fire and hailstorms of, of <laughs> destruction around everybody. Yep. Yeah. Uh, oops, oops, all blood. Oops, all blood. <laughs> oops, all Yikes. blood. <laughs> Yikes, no. <laughs> wow. Oh, my goodness. Well, is there anything else that we want to say about Nova before we pack up this this amazing discussion? Uh, Good. <laughs> no, good. Nova good. Nova good. <laughs> Nova good. Very Truly, good. I don't need to hear anything more. That's, that's, that's all I need. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, well, Spencer, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Nova. 
thank you so much for having me here. And this was unbelievably fun. Uh, I'm going to be sad leaving these characters in this world, uh, like in the ether. Um, uh, but this was this was so much fun. I had a, a great time chatting with you about Nova, and uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, can you remind everyone where they can find you online and the other things that you have going on? Absolutely. So you can find me uh, online at Gila RPGs, G-I-L-A RPGs dot com. That's my website that links to my Itch.io page where you can find all my games uh, digitally, PDF versions. Uh, or you can find the link to my Shopify where you can buy games like Nova in printed uh, format. Nova has a paperback and a hardcover copy, uh, depending on what you like. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. Otherwise, following me on Twitter at Gila RPGs is probably the best way to stay up to date on what I'm up to. I shout about my design process and the agony that it causes me all the time. So uh, <laughs> if you want to, if you want updates on that, that's probably the best thing to do. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you to everyone for tuning in. Call to action. Yeah, like that. So I, I was listening to the uh, part two of this series earlier today um, mm -hmm. as of this recording. And my goodness, I want Nova Mars so bad. <laughs> 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 I love when like world building starts to like spin out like that. Yeah. Like I could world build forever. Yeah. And I mean, and that's where I, I constantly get stuck in any kind of like gameplay or game design thing. Mm -hmm. It's why the only game I want to run is Arium because we just do the world creation and then I never have to oh, like, exactly. do anything else Um, because I could just like do that forever. Yeah. Like, like what does it mean on the neighboring planet? Uh, what happens there? Was were humans there uh, when the sun exploded? If so, mm -hmm. what are they like? If so, what are they doing now? If there's sun shards on Mars, is terraforming more possible than it was before because the sun is closer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then sun shards are also floating through space right now, hurling mm -hmm. through space that didn't hit any planets. Mm -hmm. Like what happened to them? Are there sun shards orbiting the Earth right now that got caught in the Earth's gravity? You know, there's all this cool stuff that you can do. It's just like, well, hey, this leads to this and this leads to this. And it's like, goodness gracious. World building is great. It's so good. Wish we had more time for it. I agree. Well, uh, what we don't have more time for is uh, our calls to action. So we do uh, have time for those. Well, yes. We're going to do them right now. We'll do them now. OK, good okay. plan. <laughs> and then we'll then we'll bid everybody adieu. Okay. Um, so, uh, as we mentioned in our cold open, uh, the Kickstarter for Catacon 2022 just went live last week as of the release of this episode. At the time of this recording, uh, which is the launch day for the Kickstarter, uh, they were nearly halfway to their goal already. Uh, we are uh, hopeful that we can actually get there this year. Um, it's really too soon to say anything for sure, um, given the pandemic and health issues, uh, but we're crossing our fingers. Uh, we'll put a link to the Kickstarter in the show notes. I'm probably 50-50 on whether or not we'll be there, but... Yeah, I'm I'm waiting to see, you know? Yeah. I, like, I'll back the Kickstarter, I'll get my badge, and I, we'll see what happens, I, I guess. I think I still um, have a badge from 2020 that just keeps getting kicked to the next year. Because mm. I because I had the VIP badge back then, oh, and I haven't yeah. been able to utilize it yet. Yeah. So. Yeah, I really want to go. I miss people. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. It's, Fingers crossed. It might be small enough. It might be. It might be okay. Okay enough, and mm -hmm. we'll we'll yeah. see what happens. I mean, John Con just happened, and uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, probably not nearly half as much as has happened there since it's like you know less than a percent of that size oh gosh yeah 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 we have new merch available on the one shot podcast t public store Ooh. so you can get ha your hands on our official magical girl versus necromancer shirt or stickers or a coffee mug it's or so good whatever else you desire such a good design 
It's, I'm really happy with it. Yeah. Um, it's based off the art from our four year Q and a episodes. So, um, if you look back in your, your podcast feed or on our Twitter or something like that, it's all in, it's in there. Mm. Um, or you can go to the store and just see what it looks like. I'm very happy with it. Um, we are excited to have something finally that truly represents our official brand, TM, TM, TM. (laughs) Um, we will put a link to that in the show notes. Um, Ryan and I made ourselves separate shirts. So Ryan has one that just has a magical girl and mm-hmm. I have one that just has a necromancer. Um, but this one is the official versus shirt. Yeah. So I'm very excited about it. It's so good. Uh, uh, another thing we're excited about, we've got a lot of great stuff up on our Patreon right now. Uh, patrons at the $1 and up level have access to our bonus outtakes that don't make it into the episode. And $5 and up gets you access to our Patreon archive. Uh, which includes early release episodes as they're edited and other bonus content like our actual play of the Broken RPG and a lot more. Mm -hmm. I know we have one or two games that we've recorded, um, micro games that we'll we'll get in there at some point. And um, now that we don't have (laughs) so many spotlight episodes, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, we were on a run there for a while. Exactly. Um, But yeah, there's lots of good stuff in there. It's exciting. Mm hmm. We do want to thank those of you, though, who have already backed us. You're helping keep the show running and you're making it possible for us to do even more cool stuff in the future that we like are really excited about and really want to do. So thank you to our first patron, Lieutenant, uh, for your continued support. Mm-hmm. And Eric Bontz, uh, thank you as well for your support. David, a.k.a. Tigranosaurus, former guest, thank you. Mm-hmm. Matt Newton, thank you as well. Daryl Holiday II, thank you for your support. Shadim Cabal, thank you as well. To the Shyest Barbarian, thank you so much for your support. Benjamin Sweeney, thank you as well. Lorcan McGinnis, thank you so much. Thank you to Rob Fletcher. And finally, to Kevin Brown, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our future patrons. Uh, We wouldn't be able to make this show as easily without your assistance, and we truly appreciate your generosity. If you want to support us in another way, we are once again out of reviews. Uh, You can leave a review for our show on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Podcast Addict, and Facebook. Um, We read all of our five-star reviews on the show, and we've also been sharing them every week on our social media as part of our hashtag Five Star Friday. So um, you can not only hear them here, but you can see them out in the world. Yeah, they're very nice. Um, I I like the the graphic format that that you came up with and... Uh, and it's just a nice like little celebration like a f- yeah. like follow Friday or whatever it ends up just being like a ton of hashtags and stuff and yeah. so it's really nice like five star Friday to like shout out mm-hmm. the nice things that people have said and um honestly to go back and like read them as as we're making the graphics and stuff has been really fun it's been a lot of fun um I'm also looking forward to we're thinking about doing a similar uh thing with former guests on the show uh to spotlight yeah. them and the amazing stuff that they do um and now that we have a way to do that without us having to do it ourselves every single, uh, you know, week or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, I think it'll be nice once we get it set up. Yeah. Well, that is all that we have for this series. Uh, there are five Mondays in August, so there will be a two week break and then we will be back in September. Until then, stay safe, take care, drink some water. Take some breaths and keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time. Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter. And I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at LordNeptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. 
Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permissions from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero, remixed by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guest can also be found in the show notes. If you'd like to support our show, find us on Patreon. Get access to bonus episodes, extra outtakes, and much more at patreon.com slash character creation cast. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast was hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, head on over to OneShotPodcast.com where you'll find other great shows like Mystery County Monster Hunters Club. Check out Mystery County Monster Hunters Club, an actual play podcast where the heroes are teens and the teens are a mess. Join a group of impulsive but well-meaning after-school monster hunters in the year 2006, doing their best to protect a weird little town in the 51st state of Superior. Through the game Monster of the Week, this cast of improvisers confronts cryptids, magic, and the biggest monster of all, feelings. Find Mystery County Monster Hunters Club at mysterycounty.com or your favorite podcast app. Nailed it. There we go. (laughs) Got it in one. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I even checked to make sure that it was the right microphone. Yeah. I'm like, so professional. (laughs) Very. (laughs) Now you got me checking the. the yeah, see wait, if I I'm got like, the oh my god! It's <laughs> like I don't understand why. Like Audacity is like fifty fifty. Like last time I opened it up, it's uh, it's the settings are all right the first time. This time, not so much. Huh. I don't know what the deal is. Love that. Very strange. Big fan. All right, so we could go ahead and stop our recordings now. Okay. All right. Hey. Get back down to that part of the outline. Do I have to talk? Yes, I do. <laughs> I'm very jazzed about the fanfic. I'm really excited about this. It's great. Oh, oh so All good. All right. I will do a five count and then we will go. All right. Yay, we can stop over. Time to stop this one.